We are live, live on the Metal Voice today. Um, a guy who's been on the show a few times, uh, you know, the co-founding member of Quiet Riot, uh, also a photographer, uh, an author. I'm sure there's a, a restaurant, a restaurant tour at one point, correct? Yeah. Kelly yeah. Garney. Kelly, what's going on? Hey, nothing. I'm just uh, hanging around the house here, waiting for guys like you to call me up. <laughs> so let, let me let me just start off with this here, okay? So when I say author, look at this. Oh, yeah. Angels with dirty faces. This is the story of Kelly Garney, his time, I guess, in the LA scene, growing up with the one and only Randy Rhodes. Look how thick that is. Look at that. Look at that read. I know when when it came out, you know, because I figured I was going to make a lot of enemies with this book. I had no idea it was that thick. And so when I got it and I said, well, this will be perfect for these people. I piss off to beat me to death with because this thing weighs a ton. And there's very little pictures, too. It's all writing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's pictures on the back here. For everybody yeah, wants yeah. to see, right? It's it's not like a whole big thing, you know. This year, it's you and Randy, right? There's Randy and there's you. And it just kind of yeah. shows the sort of the friendship, you know, little kids growing up together, right? Oh, absolutely. That's that's how it was, you know. I mean, uh, we, we were just young kids and we met in school and, you know, his, his whole household was uh, musically addicting, so I had to fit in. And, uh, and that's how I became a bass player. Very, very cool. And we've done, like, I actually did a two-parter. And people, if they want to know the whole background of the book and what the content of the book and the stories behind the book, definitely, Rudy Sarzo's got a book. His sort of, yours is like part one of Rocky, like Rocky one. And Rudy Sarzo's is like Rocky two. It's sort of like it continues along the timeline of Randy Rhodes's, uh, you know, journey, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no, uh, Ru Rudy did a very good book, and um, it was a great follow-up to my book because it really chronicles kind of, you know, everything up to the the last minute, really, of Randy's life. So I feel between me and, and Rudy, we documented the whole journey pretty well. Very, very cool. Okay, now here's the big thing. Here's the big news right now. Everybody, go buy yourself a book. Yeah, go buy that book. It's really good. I swear to God, I, I read it once. It was good. That's right. And here, okay, I'm going to show everybody sort of the, the, the big news is from no, no Remorse Records, and I'll show you I'll show their logo because they've been so gracious. Right here, look at this. No Remorse Records. Is that the bag? Yeah, it's a bag. Did you get one? No. All right, well, oh, what oh, they've oh. done, and okay, so from the information that I've gathered... They kind of were, and actually I'll go back even even further than that. Anyone I've ever interviewed, uh, be it Kelly Rhodes, be it you, be it uh, Frankie Benali over the years, I've always asked about the first two Quiet Ride albums. Because when I was a kid, it was sort of this mysterious, uh, you know, these mysterious albums that no one could ever get sort of, you know, that were mass produced. I, I was one of those kids. I could mysteriously never get one. <laughs> Even though you played on them, they wouldn't give you any. <laughs> no, they gave me five copies. All right. Two. Oh. The no, last. Originally, yeah, originally when when they, when it first came out, they said, "Here's your copies," and we went five. And they said, "Yeah, yeah, well, we need the rest of them, you know, to give out to radio stations and record companies and all this." So. You know, you had five records, one of which you might want to keep for yourself, you know, so that left you with four copies to give to your parents, your, you know, your, your, your personal roadie, you know, whoever, um, you know, it really didn't uh, give us too much room to work with as far as having them out. I, um, when I, when I spoke to Frankie, and I kept asking him and asking him and asking him, are you ever going to release these albums? And the last time I talked to him, I guess before he died, it was some sort of, we're in talks. I didn't know what that meant. He just didn't say any more than that. We're in talks. 
only only to realize fast forward to today that he was in talks and re-releasing these suckers right here right yeah so it went from kevin who had the masters maybe you want to tell everybody kevin had the masters how did the where did they all go the masters well what what happened here in this whole entire deal as far as the music itself i'm not even going to get into the can of worms yet that what's going on behind the scenes is, as far as the release. Uh, I can a little bit, but not that much. But you have to remember, you know, what happened here was basically everybody died. <laughs> I mean, that's the bottom line. Kevin uh, got, a, had, he actually had the original tapes, the big two inch tapes or whatever they were. Mm -hmm. And he actually had those. And Kevin had a tendency to not keep things in such great condition. Like I went over to his house once and he had this big box in his garage. And he said, hey, do you want this stuff? I want to get rid of it. And the box was like stained from like a water leak. And, and it was all beat up from, from moving or, or something. I don't know. Everything in there had been in there a long time. You could tell by the box. And so I start digging through the box and I find like piles and piles of negatives and pictures and all this. And, and I said, well, I said, why do you want to get rid of this stuff? And, and he says, well, I don't need it anymore. And I said, well, I'll take them because I was a photographer at the time. And there were lots of negatives in there that were, uh, uh, nice formats that I like to work with. And um, I had my own dark room, of course, as a photographer. And so I said, eh, you know, these might be kind of fun to blow up, you know. And um, so I took it. And, and when I was going through it, what actually uh, one of the negatives I found was was the actual negative for our official promo shop, which I usually send out with the book or give to anybody that requests them. Uh, but there was the negative for that. And that was an eight by 10 negative. Mm -hmm. And the way they used to do things back then was they uh, used a red film to blank out areas that they didn't want any of light to hit because the photographic paper was not sensitive to red light. So that blacked anything out and just left it white. And so, um, it, it you know, it was all set up with all the logos and the, and the band name on there and everything. And, and I had never worked with a negative that big. And I thought, wow, this is great. How cool. You know, and I took it in my dark room and I, I was able to start printing off pictures, you know, right off with it. It was really cool. And there were a lot of other pictures in there too that I, eventually blew up or uh, put into sets, uh, none, of, none of which uh, is really around anymore for me to do anything with. Um, but uh, Kevin had a tendency getting back to the original thing. He was messy. He was messy, yeah, when it came, came to things like that. And so I don't know where these master tapes were kept in Kevin's world, but uh, he, he got to a point where he wanted to. Uh, uh, I think you got a call coming in. <laughs> my secretary will handle it. <laughs> he got to a point where he wanted to do something with, with those old tapes, and that resulted in the Randy Rose years. However, in the process of doing that, he discovered that these tapes were basically somewhat destroyed and deteriorated, and they had to be baked, which is a process they use to restore tapes like that. He had that done. That was pretty expensive, but he had a guy in Florida who was uh, behind all this, Pat Armstrong at, at Park Records, and Kevin then took the tapes, and at this point, I can only guess because Kevin never really went into detail with it about me. He always went into detail about what he did to make the songs better. So I don't know what he did with these tapes. 
I'm assuming that they were transferred into some sort of digital format, be it a DVD, CD, whatever, so that they could be managed in a digital way. And so upon Kevin's passing, this got handed down to Frankie. Yeah. And upon his passing, and apparently, according to you, I don't, I've never heard that story that Frank, that there was already a deal working. Because some of us are. I'm just going to be clear. He never said there was a deal. <coughs> he just alluded that I'm working on something. That's all, all he ever said to me. So he okay. was alluding something's in the works. He never said there was a deal. He never said anything. He just alluded that, Jimmy, enough's enough. Something's going on, kind of thing. Well, okay. <laughs> but it sounds like he had something going on with him himself. Basically, we can certainly agree on that. And, you know, I, I would, how long, when you had that conversation with him, this, this is the question I would have, how, how long before his death did you have that conversation? Now I'm the interview guy. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I, I, I mean, has it been a year since he died or two years? I, I, I'm i trying to remember. It's been at least two been at least two so let's say when he released his last album with quiet riot in that time frame if you want to say two to three years ago but keep in mind i've asked him this question more than one time but the last time i spoke to him i kind of he kind of alluded to that something was in the works which cro i cross reference with no remorse and they said there they were working with frankie for a few years now then he passed away, and then they wanted to complete it with uh, the estate of Frankie. That's what they told me. So that all makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, the thing is, to some people, not to me, and not apparently to a lot of people. But uh, what what people ended up getting was basically the, the first album left untouched because Kevin Novick never got around to it. Yeah. Let me let me just show this to everybody as you talk. Hold on, hold on. Let me just bring it out here. Look at this. Ah. And the, I didn't open actually open this guy yet. I didn't crack it open. But I do have cuz I just wanted to preserve this, you know. I listened to the CD and you are correct. It's just basically been remastered uh, and, and and touched up. Sounds amazing. And the they, vinyl, they spectacular. They did a hell of a job. That's the way it should have sounded in the first place. Yes. And, you know, but we, we had poor direction in those days and weren't working with some of the people that were probably better suited for us to work with. So... That's where all this came from out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. There is, there is, you know, and the purists out there, the people, you know, who say, oh, I want the original, original, original. Well, it sounds like shit. So, you know, this sounds better, you know. This many years later, you know, be glad you're getting anything, you know. Uh, you know, uh, senior citizens such as this. And um, it, it's just, you know, I can understand people wanting the original, original stuff, um, but it just sounds so much better. Uh, when I listened to Quiet Riot 2, which was the first one I listened to. Um, oh, this one, I'll open it up as you can speak, because this one I did open up. Yeah. Because I knew there was a lot more in there, okay? Yeah. And we'll get to the audio portion of it. Okay, so I just want to show everybody, this is Quiet Riot 2, and I'll show the posters. First of all, where's the opening? Here it is. The thickness. This is the black version, okay? There's different colors. This is so thick. It's, it's not like your typical album that you bought in the 80s or 90s. These are like really thick. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely yeah. Stunning. If you're a completist or a massive Quiet Riot fan or just a fan of music, there you go. It's beautiful. 
Let me do the yeah, unboxing, yeah. if you don't mind, of what's inside. This will, this is really going to blow everybody's mind. So then you have the back cover, and you do make a guest appearance, Kelly. You make a guest appearance on this album, do you not? I do, yes. Right here, right here, in the locker, if you take a microscope, <laughs> you can oh. see Kelly Garney with Choir Riot from the first album, correct? Possibly on the first photo bomber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do play on this album. Uh, However, Rudy Sarzo yeah. was in the picture. They they would have had to call the SWAT team on me to make me do that cover because there is just no damn way I'd ever do that. Now, I just want to show everybody else this. Now, watch. This is the inner, the liner notes. So these are all by Ron Sobel, who everybody knows as the sort of the early years of Randy Rhodes, right? fantastic photographer and he has a, D a dvd out called the randy Rhodes years you should go pick it up look at this the words to the songs right and they Mama are the mia, look at this look at this beautiful great stuff beautiful yeah, they... oh. beautiful and then hold on there's more you know what this is right you got this well, there's two of them. One's good, one's not. Mama, look at this. This is going to blow your mind. Look at that. Ah. Look at this. Well, you're not there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> would you have done that shoot? If, if, if they no. would have told you, why don't you wear like the sailor hat or something? Would they would have done it? I would have fought this. All right. Now and you can speak to the, the audio. Fire. Go ahead. I would have lost. I would have done it anyway. You, you, you didn't have any control. I sure did. You know, it was like, hey, you do this. You know, this okay. is the way. It is. Since I rudely cut you off, tell us about the audio aspect of this re-release. Well, certainly it's been remastered, and somebody did some work on them. And I played um, the vinyl. Um, I got the silver vinyl. And again, yeah, the, the thickness of the vinyl is amazing. Uh, my wife and I are very into vinyl. We have a very, very large collection and um, run it through uh, 70s air uh, amps. And, um, you know, because we, we want that sound. And I was, I was blown away by how good they sound. Um, one thing I, I did really like about Quiet Riot 2 was that when Kevin did the Randy Rose years and he had told me he did this and he was telling me all about it, about how he took away everything um, on a song. Um, what the hell is this song called? Trouble. Uh, a Trouble? Live Afterglow. Afterglow, yes, yes, acoustic version, yes. Yeah, well, it's an acoustic version on the Randy Rhodes years, but it was originally recorded with all of us, and that version is included on these albums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With so, everybody. Yeah, so I, what I did is I, I tried to listen to this album, and, you know, I went on YouTube and I listened to the original, right? Yeah. I was trying to compare it. This album sounds so good. And it's to your point. This is the way it should have been released. Exactly. It's yeah. a pretty good album. And, you know, people kind of over the years said, uh, it's not so great. The way Kevin sort of brought out the guitar, how he brought out the vocals, it was, he remixed this and remastered this. Yeah. Kevin was actually very, very good in the studio, surprisingly good, as a matter of fact. And, um, you know, what he did, he was traveling to Florida to the, to the Park Records, to their recording studio, to do all this work. So he was there quite a bit. <clears throat> and he'd come back and he'd tell me what was going on and play me things and all that. And... Um, but he put a lot of work into it. He was pretty proud of, of how it, he made them sound. I only wish that, that the first album sounded as good as the second one does now. Yeah, yeah. And 
I'm kind of glad with this release that you really get two sides of the coin here in that with Fire Riot 1, you get how, how raw it sounded. It, it doesn't sound that great. And, um, you know, clearly any, any records you hear from that time period sound a whole lot better to prove my point that, you know, we really weren't working with the greatest people. We were in really good recording studios. We just didn't have the right people touching the knobs. Let you me know. ask you this. Did Randy ever turn to you and say, you know, I really want to rip on this song. I really want to do a career, you know, just a really go out, you know, on this solo, just really, you know, have like an amazing solo, kind of like in the Aussie vein or the Aussie sort of vibe. Did he ever come to you and say, I don't want to do this pop rock kind of thing. I want to just rip. Oh, that's a good question and has a pretty easy answer. For one thing, he'd never say that in a million years. He would just do it. He didn't tell you. He didn't advertise. He just did it. All, right. so there was no all his playing came from within him. And he didn't have to, you know, advertise. Now I'm really going to do something. You know anything along those lines he just wouldn't do it he he just did it and you heard it and you went wow do you ever like I, i've talked to kelly many times kelly rhodes and a great person you know you know being the brother of such a a legend like randy rhodes you know it's like a blessing and a curse right because you are part of the legacy the family but at the same time Every day, wherever you go, they ask you, tell me something about Randy. Tell me something about Randy. And it's great that you want to tell everybody. But, you know, there's some days where it gets a little out of hand. Do you have that? Does that happen to you in your life? It, it kind of happens to me a little bit. <clears throat> I'm not as accessible, uh, you know, as, as the Rhodes family is where, you know, I don't have a music school, you know, where I'm there and stuff like that, you know, and the public can just walk in. Um, but you know what, we all signed up for this and it, it just goes with the territory. You know, I'm not a super famous person, but you know, I do, I do have to at, answer a lot of questions from people once they find out. And I actually try to avoid that but it does happen. Right. And, uh, and then somebody comes up and they, they want to know things and they want a picture and they want you to sign something. And, 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 and you know what? That's phenomenal. That's just great. And I love it. Um, as far as the Rhodes family, they get it way worse than me because of their last name. But again, you know. They're very gracious about it. And I'm not, I don't mean it in any mean way. They're very gracious about it. But yeah, they are. They're very gracious about it. They're and they're they're very responsive to the fans, and they do everything they can. Yeah. Well, you know, if you want to opt out, you can. You know, it's like look at uh, Ozzy. Okay, Ozzy. Uh, apparently, there's there's a whole other daughter other than Kelly. <laughs> That's probably right. named after me. I would. <laughs> okay. But, Hello. Um. But no, there's like a whole other daughter, you know. And Amy. She wasn't on the show, and, she, and you know, she's not out there all over the place. And you know, she she just she decided, you know, I don't, I don't want any part of this circus, and I don't blame her, to be honest with you. It's yeah. very time consuming, and uh, you know, it's not always uh, that great to have people kind of knowing your past everywhere you go. Here's some questions, okay? There's people like a few people sending a chat, and if anybody has any questions to uh, Kelly, by all means, I could ask. Did Kevin? And this is the question that you and I talked about before the interview. Did Kevin re-record the vocals on Quiet Riot too? I, I'm still well, trying absolutely. to figure it out. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you know, not on all the songs. I think it's more like punch-ins. 
he, he punched it up in the areas where it was a little weak. Well, this this is one occasion when when time, generally sometimes our enemy, when it comes to your abilities, um, this is one time when it worked out for the best. Got to remember, Kevin was pretty young when he did those albums. He was nineteen. He was twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe his balls hadn't dropped yet, although he acted <laughs> otherwise. But eventually they did, and he got this whole new voice when it came time to do Metal Health. So I, I, I'll never forget when him and I kissed and made up, one of the first things he said to me was, I finally learned how to sing, because he knows that I always said that he was the worst singer in the world. And I had to admit, he did sound pretty good now. Yeah, he, and things changed too, you know. I mean, but but Kevin Kevin's voice developed because he got older, and and he finally did, you know, he you know now he was drinking and stuff like that, you know, which he didn't do in Quiet Riot, and you know all that kind of stuff uh, does affect and change a voice. So in Kevin's case, it did, and he did have a great voice. I think Kevin's a fantastic singer. One of the best, absolutely, yeah, yeah, definitely. Did, did uh, from the, everybody that I spoke to about Kevin, he did never. He never wanted these albums to be released. I guess up until he did the Quiet Riot, Randy Rhodes tribute album, right? He never wanted these albums to be released. Even the Rhodes, the uh, Dolores Rhodes wasn't a. a a fan of those albums either because she knew Randy didn't want those albums to be released. Yeah. I don't want to get into all that, but just high level here. Yeah. I, uh, as far as Kevin, you know, uh, maybe he always planned on um, putting these albums out. I never, I never heard him say that he didn't want them out there. I never heard him say that. You know, he might have said, you know, something along the lines like, oh, well, those albums were shit, you know, and, and he would have been correct, you know, at the time. Uh, but still, you know, they, they had a, a certain amount of charm for the, for the time period and, and the people involved in, in making them as far as the players. But I never heard Kevin say that. And obviously he had a plan because he... Uh, uh, came out with, it was his idea to come up with this whole uh, Randy Rhodes years thing. That was all him. And he came to me and he said, you know, will you help me with this? And I said, yeah. And, um, and we worked together on that. As far as Randy and his family not wanting those albums out, um, I, think, I think what happened there, at least this is what I like to believe, is, is that, you know, Randy was hyper, hyper critical about his own play. Yeah. And when Randy played something, it sounded great. But the next day, or maybe even five minutes from now, it sounded a whole lot better. He was, he was well aware of his ability to progress. So, you know, having done the Aussie stuff and, and done such, such a phenomenal job on all that stuff, I'm sure he looked at these little albums and went, "Oh God, don't ever keep them in Japan. Them. Keep them in Japan." <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. It's some guy that looks like me. I never wore a bow tie. See me wear a bow tie in Aussie? No, I'm not wearing one. You know, it's not me. But so what I think happened is is Brandy probably made a statement that he hopes nobody ever hears him. This was taken what I would consider to be as a personal opinion, you know, a little bit too seriously, because I remember the day we got our five albums and you couldn't have found any happier people in, in the whole world. I mean, that was a big milestone, particularly for me and Rand, who had been at this for quite a few years. You know, Kevin was relatively new. He hadn't done it. Me and Randy had already done all kinds of shit, you know, and now all of a sudden 
we have a record. So and, and, and us, might I say, uh, let me just get it back here. I just want to tell everybody, this is an incredible book. And everything you're talking about in detail is here, okay? About growing up with Randy, the Starwood with Randy, Kawhi Ride Breaking. And I should say a shout out to Melissa who actually contributed to, I think, was it photos or I can't remember, Melissa? Who, was it photos or she had a... But anyways, bottom line is I want to tell everybody that that book chronicles what you're saying right now in great detail. Thank you very much for the compliments on that. I appreciate them. And, and you know, I just tried to lay it down really honest, you know, me, me with a somewhat questionable past, you know, one would be certainly justified in questioning my memory. But I'll tell you what, I remembered everything. It, it came back to me quite easily. And I was fortunate enough to talk to a lot of people and even interview them for this book. And they even reminded me of things I forgot about. And so I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that now. Okay. Melissa Whitney, that's her name. I, I just escaped me. I interviewed her as well. Melissa, who was the one of uh, Kevin's fan she had club? A, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, I, I don't know her. I don't know anything about her. Apparently, she wrote a book or something. I don't know. She did. She did. It's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. It's coming I, out. It's coming out. Yeah. Go ahead. She should send me one. I'll send her one of my books. Shit. She's watching. <laughs> Go ahead. If you're watching. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Anyways, I mean. The albums got fixed up as best they could. They're very old now. A lot of time has passed. And again, everybody's lucky to get everything or anything for that matter. And, you know, sure, you can take Randy's feelings into consideration that he wouldn't want anybody to hear him playing badly. But I'll tell you what, you know, these things are bootlegged right off a straight vinyl and left and right. And they have been for. 30 years, if not more than that, and sold, and everybody makes all this money and, and all this. And I, I've just always just said, whatever, you know, because I don't care about the money. It's, you know, I just like people to get the music. And, and so, you know, Rand, Randy would at least be happy they got remastered. And I think Kevin, so too. I think Kevin would actually be happy about this Quiet Riot, too. I, I, I think, um, well, I know Kevin would be over, overjoyed with them. Um, but as far as Randy, yeah, he, you know, were he alive, he would understand, you know, his popularity. He, he would be very cognizant of that. And he would say, okay, well, yeah. I can understand why people want to hear this old stuff. We used to do it too. We loved Alice Cooper. What did we do? We went way back into Alice Cooper's history and studied it all as well as we could, you know, and listened to, you know, some albums um, that Alice Cooper did before Love of the Death, which was really the album that just lit the fuse in me and Randy. Um, but uh, and, yeah. and tell and tell everybody his thoughts about Black Sabbath. You know, he wasn't really a big fan of Black Sabbath back in the day, correct? Randy well, Rhodes. No, actually, um, we didn't know who they were. We had absolutely no idea. We went to see Alice Cooper, and second bill on the on that bill was a band called Savage Grace, who had a big hit out called Lovely Lady of the Mountain which we really loved. It was played on the radio. We didn't own the record or anything. It was played on the, on the popular rock stations of, of the time. And uh, we really liked the song. And we learned it, of course. Anything we liked, we learned. And that taught us something every time. So we thought we were going to see Savage Grace. So we show up for the concert, and they said, well, it's not going to be Savage Grace. They canceled, so it's going to be these guys in Black Oak, Arkansas. And we're like, who the fuck is that? You know? 
And, and to us, it sounded like we were going to have to watch a hillbilly band or something. So we were like, yeah, all right, well, whatever. You know, we've never been to a concert before anyway. So let's see what happens here. And, and when they came on, it was like, oh my God, these guys are good. They're really good. And, and their look was like how we were already dressing somewhat, but then we took their look and mixed it in with what we saw in Alice Cooper. And that of course got us in lots of trouble at school. <laughs> Let me ask but, you. Oh, go ahead. And then musically, after that concert, we went out and we got we got a hold of their album, and we bought it. And we learned a lot of songs off that album. One song we learned in particular that I love to play because it had a a bass solo in it was uh, when electricity came to Arkansas. That was probably one of our favorite songs. Okay. And we continued to follow them all the way up until they got uh, Ruby Star. We thought she was great. We never went and saw them again, but we listened to them and listened to what they were doing. By the time they came along and did anything else, boom, Bowie was happening, and we were all about that. Someone saying Black Sabbath, not Arkansas. I think you're saying Black Oak, Arkansas. That that's the band that you're referring to. Somebody saying not yeah. Black Sabbath. Yeah, isn't that who you asked about? No, I said Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath. Oh, Black Sabbath. Yeah. Black Sunday, Black Sabbath. Um, what okay. was was Randy a fan of Black Sabbath? Oh yeah, no, we were not. And and you know what? All these years later, I, I cannot figure out why we didn't like them. Uh, the only thing I can come up with is that we thought the music was too simple. Uh, if you do listen to something like Black Oak, Arkansas. If you listen to that song, uh, When Electricity Came to Arkansas, that's a very complicated song. But we learned it note for note. And I learned every bass line in that song. You know, but the Black Sabbath stuff was just like uh, three chords, you know. It, and, and to us, it sounded very dated. And for whatever reason, not that the two, Randy was raised religiously, I was not. Uh, whatever the reason, the, the whole sort of satanic dark, you know, yeah, rock angle. Yeah, I got it. Feel to us. You know, we were into looking cool. And, and to us, these guys didn't even look that cool. So. And it's strange enough because, you know, he worked with Ozzy from Black Sabbath. And Tommy Aldrich was in Black Oak, Arkansas. You know, he ended up working with him too. So that's pretty amazing. It was a very big deal. Yeah. When we played, we did a show um, with them. And that was really the last time we, we saw them live was when they played with us. But um, I even completely forgot about that. But yeah, Tommy was the drummer that night. And we were already very familiar with Tommy because he famously did this drum solo with his hands. And we thought that was the greatest thing in the world because nobody had ever really done that before. And me and Randy were all about, let's do something nobody ever did before. And every time somebody came along and did something nobody ever did before, we were like, yeah, that's more like it, you know? Change all this shit up, you know? Get away from the Black Sabbath three riff thing, you know? Let's do some music. And so, so yeah, we, we got to meet Tommy. We didn't interact with them too much the night of that show, but uh, we definitely went out and watched them play a little. Yeah. I did a little bit. Randy may have stayed longer. I don't know. When, actually, let me ask you this question, because I asked you this question before we did the interview. We did an interview, interview with Rudy Sarzo. He just rejoined Quiet Riot. And, and I mean this, I, I love Rudy. Rudy's amazing. He's an amazing bassist. You know, perception's interesting because Rudy, I asked Rudy, I, I, I can't remember how the conversation went, but it went to the point where I go something like, Rudy, but you're not an original member. And he goes, no, of course I'm an original member. It's fair enough. If, you know, perception is, you know, it's fair, it's, it's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I go, but what about Kelly Garney? Wasn't he the original member? 
wasn't he the original bassist? Uh, and he goes, well, Quiet Riot really wasn't, and I'm just I'm paraphrasing here, Quiet Riot really wasn't, you know, signed to a major label and they weren't a major band. There was no contract. So, you know, it's, it was a little discussion we had. And and you know what? There's no wrong or right wrong or right answer here. But, yeah. you know, what what is your perception of, of you know, you definitely you're a co-founder of Quiet Riot. That, that's, that's a given. That's a given. You know, I don't think he would even argue that. But yeah, no, no, he, he wouldn't. And um, you know, I don't know why he would say that. You know, Quiet Riot was what it was with our, you know, somewhat inadequate, but still to this day I consider to be very generous uh, record deal that we had with Japan, CBS Sony. Um yeah, that's all we have. But uh, you know, I I feel Rudy's an original member. He he replaced me. <laughs> you know, so you know he was in that band too, and it was already called Quiet Riot, and it was you know um, Quiet Riot. You know, otherwise, why else would they would have? would have had them pl have me play on New Year's, you know, uh, an original member. So I don't know why you would make that statement. I don't take offense whatsoever. No, and neither do I. I just, I just, it's, 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 I think what you, you've told me before, you know, there's two chapters to quiet, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's, a, it's a very unique situation, quiet, riot, Where there was two bands with, two legacies in a sense, right? The Randy Rhodes era, we'll yeah. call it. And then, yeah, you know, it's kind of unusual. I can't think of another band that, that like, you know, had something going on and, and should have, could have, would have. And, and then, you know, and then made it big or, or a member made it big, you know? Um, and then Kevin comes along and does what he does with mental health, which I thought was great. And, um, I don't think that's ever really happened before. And I think that's why people still find the band fascinating because of you had a guitarist who was, you know, like one of the legendary guitarists of all time, but he passed away too soon. Yeah. Then you had another chapter of Quiet Riot, which is like the number one metal album on the charts, which is yeah. a completely, it's just, it's, it's just an anomaly. It's a very unique bad situation that doesn't exist with anyone else well you know we always wanted to be entertaining so <laughs> i mean here you get uh side a and side b of quiet riot definitely definitely all right so what do you remember so if we go back to quiet riot one i'm not going to pull out the album because it's too heavy where's a little where's a little cd you go back to quiet riot one right how yeah. quickly did you write this album, put it together and record it? There's two cover songs on this. <clears throat> um, you know, I, that memory is a little foggy, but I, I would say easily from the time they said, because we were already doing most of these songs. Yeah. And we were already on a rigorous rehearsal schedule. So these songs were we're ready to basically go. And so it wasn't very long. We had to continue to keep them that way um, until we got actually into re the recording studio. Now that takes some time. You have to book the studio, you gotta find the great producer we had. And, um, you know, you had to put all those deals together and b before you even went in and did them. So um, we just really, really just worked on rehearsing and fine tuning them and really recording that first album was pretty easy as far as what we had to play. Um, working with some of the people was great and working with some of them was not so great. Um, like our constantly missing producer who was at the bar next door. But um, 
yeah, we, we were ready to go, you know, as soon as they said, you get to record an album, you know, we were like, when did we start? We were ready. Do you find that, so when I was reading the magazines when I was a kid and these albums were released or after they were released, in my mind, I'm thinking like they recorded in Japan, they had a following in Japan. Did, was there like any following back then in 78? like a Japanese following of some sort, or it was just released and nobody really knew it was being released. Like in 78, that is. Oh, oh, there was, there was a gigantic following. In fact, uh, that's interesting. You should ask that question. Um, I just dug out the other day, a big, big packet I had of fan mail that we used to get back then. Wow which me and Randy were religious about answering every letter. We couldn't believe somebody wrote us a letter, you know, some, you know, 14 year old girl in Japan thinks she wants to marry me because they all said, um, so, uh, yeah, we had, we, and what we were told and what we saw in magazines as far as ads and articles and interviews we did and stuff like that, we were very, very, very convinced that we could not walk down the street in Japan. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we had enough things going on that indicated, you know, we, we had uh, a good following there, not to mention every week they're telling you, well, you're leaving next week to go to Japan on a tour with, uh, you know, Cheap Trick or Kiss or somebody. And, um, and then it never happens, you know? And so- So there, there was like, there must've been airplay. They must've been playing it on the radio, I would think. I would assume so, yeah. Right? Yeah. For all you know, you have a platinum album in Japan and you're just at home and you have no idea. That could be very easily, yeah. We, but all we knew was that we got a lot of fan mail and thank God the fans back then would often send us magazines that we appeared in yeah. so that we have a copy. And um, so I had a huge collection of those and we were in a lot of magazines, all the most prestigious Japanese magazines that were around. Um, we were in all of them. And, and so you said, well, I guess I made it in Japan, you know, around here, I still have to go to the laundromat to wash my clothes, but, uh, you know, in Japan, I guess we're a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Which we could go there, but it just never happened. So, so never materialized actually having some sort of supporting slot or tour or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. Never, you never. No. Not even a little vacation there for a few days just to see what's going on. It was a pretty brutal deal, you know. I mean, we worked six days a week. Um, there was no excuses for time off. All right, and, and then you record the second album. It's in '78 as well, or '79? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. And, you did. And you did record everything on the second album on Quiet Riot too. Yeah, yeah I did. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, I know Randy had to do a couple little bass touch-ups, mm -hmm. but there's, as far as the playing, when I listen to him, I go, that's what I played. You know, maybe he interjected a little three-second thing that he thought, you know, he could play better than I did, uh, but I can't tell. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it went pretty much the same way. We were, we were well rehearsed, although uh, for some time, after the release of the first album, we were told, well, now you got to get ready for the second album. So you guys need to write some songs and they need to be like this. And they need to be, you know, like the Bay City Rollers and you need a hook and, and you know, and, and think about radio friendly and, you know, and all this stuff. And, you know, I, I just, really wish they'd have left us alone. I mean, can you imagine Van Halen and some genius walks up to him and says, Eddie, you know what? You're never gonna make it unless you wear a bow tie. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. You know, Van Halen was great because 
People left them alone like they were. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we weren't broke. Let me ask you, did you ever, uh, there is, there are, there were shows where you, there was actually one show where you played with Van Halen, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that you or Rudy? I don't remember. Well, that was me. Yeah. And, and what was Van, like when you saw Van Halen for the first time, what did you think? You thought, man, these guys are better than us or we're better than them. Or wow, these guys are going to make it. Or yeah, it's another band. Well, interestingly, I've never seen them. <laughs> no, you didn't see them that night? Nope. Nope. Never saw them. They were playing around, you know, kind of where we were in Hollywood. I didn't go to the kind of clubs that they played at, which were different than the clubs we played at, um, which was the Starwood mm -hmm. and even the Troubadour. They pretty much uh, were always at Gazaris, and that was more of a upper class crowd there that I didn't want to be around. And so Randy did go there and he saw them, uh, but I never went. And then the night we did play with them, the only interaction I had with them whatsoever was there was some sort of an issue with our stage setup and Rody came down to our dressing room and said sweet that we had to come up there and intervene. And Kevin and I went one of the few times we did something together. And um, and we talked to David Lee Roth and Michael Anthony. And we had a bit of an argument and it got a little, little testy. Um, I don't remember who won. I just know it was a pretty minor issue that didn't affect what we did that night. So we went up, we did our show. Um, it was at a college and our dressing room was basically the drama department dressing room. And so there was all this stuff in there, all these clothes. And so we, um, you know, I knew there was a giant party going on down there after I played, so. I, I just headed down there and I never went back out and, you know, said, oh, I'll see these other guys. I really, I literally didn't care. I didn't care. You know, they're good, great. You know, uh, the only time I cared about Van Halen was the first time I heard eruption. And I went, oh my God, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> now I kind of wish I would have saw them. <laughs> then you would have had a story, right? <laughs> yeah, when I, first heard that, I was like blown away. I'm like, whoa! Was this was there really, you know, that rival rivalry between Randy and Eddie Van Halen, or was that sort of just you know a, a myth that was just kind of blown out of proportion over the years? Like, um, I would say it's definitely a myth, mm -hmm. uh, blown out of proportion, perhaps, but. Randy didn't see, the only competition Randy saw in the entire world was himself and tomorrow. And he competed with tomorrow because whatever he played today, he wanted to play it better tomorrow. He was that driven. Randy didn't think about other guitar players. He listened to them. He studied them. He would steal licks, sure. But then he'd maybe turn it into something that was distinctly him you know we had to learn from somewhere we were learning off the radio and whatever records we could get our hands on you know it wasn't like today where it's so easy for people to learn you yeah. know which which makes me wonder like i see all like these uh on instagram or even on facebook like this really hot girl <clears throat> and she's like ripping on guitar and i'm like is this fake but now that there's so many of them, I'm not sure it's 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 that fake. And and then you have great great bands like Plush, the Welcome Girls, you know. And the best all girl band I ever saw in my life was uh, the Iron Maidens. Yeah, just an incredible show. Well, it, it there there's a shift, you know. Like it used to be a male dominated genre, right? This hard rock metal thing yeah. and now what you're saying 
is the the new wave of women, you know, or younger ladies, you know, starting like when we did, when we were young, you know, playing our instruments and and sort of that's how it begins. And now you're going to see a floodgate of, uh, you know, uh, mixed bands, right? Men, women or women, all women, you know, which is great. You know, it, it's more ideas. And I back it 100 percent. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, I think it opens doors for them. Um, you know, look at the girl from uh, the Iron Maidens. What's her name? Um, yeah, Anita Strauss with Alice yeah, Cooper. Nita. Yeah, I saw them with Nita. Yeah. And I met all them because I was with a, a friend of mine who was visiting from Japan and she was good friends with all them. And so I got to meet all them after the show and I just thought, well, you're, really, you're just a cover band. I didn't feel like I was meeting any rock stars. But, you know, if I met Nita today, I'd be like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you know? no, she, she's, yeah, she, we met her. I mean, and uh, it's just she's amazing. very good. She's amazing. Like, uh, and they have that kind of a look, you know, all these chicks, you know, and, and, and that's really, really amazing to see, but it's so easy to learn now because you can learn like no, that, no. that's a good point. You know, YouTube, you know, we're YouTube yeah. plumbers now, we're YouTube electricians, we're YouTube musicians, right? You learn how to do things on YouTube. So it's up the game. It's really up the game, but in a sense, like in your day, in my day, we had to actually play the record back and forth. You'd have to move the needle to, to, to figure out the riff, right? You have to keep moving it, and it got frustrating. And then when I had to write the lyrics, I, I had to listen. I didn't know what they were saying. So yeah, you weren't quite sure. Yeah, it, um, you know, it was just a different way of learning with kind of the same result. Some greatness ensued from absolutely really nothing. We'll see what happens with rock and roll with all these new style of players, yeah, new yeah. gender players. Absolutely. Um, so everybody, I want you to pick up the book, or you could even watch the episode of The Metal Voice when I talk to Kelly about the incident. We'll call it the incident that got him out of Quiet Riot. And Rudy Sarzo comes in. We'll talk about okay. the incident. <laughs> That's a cliffhanger. I'm innocent. <laughs> the incident... And for all you people out there who want to know about the incident, it's right here. It's right in the book. Or you could watch the Metal Voice where I interview Kelly. He gives us a detailed account of the incident. Uh, yeah, the you incident. like that, don't you? Now everyone's going to buy it. And, and now you've got all these guys out there. They're doing worse shit than I ever did. And I'm like, I guess the I'm incident fine. that got okay. him out of Quiet Riot now, this is what I'm getting to. Rudy replaces you. Yeah. In the original Quiet Riot, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And only until recently have you actually sat down, I would assume that's what you told me, you sat down and you actually talked to Rudy. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. That was, that was uh, I would actually say for me, it was one of the most amazing times, moments in my life, really the time I got to spend with Rudy because, you know, all these years, I write about meeting him when he was with Randy and Ozzy. And he, he just, and I don't, it might seem unflattering what I wrote, but that's what he did. He had all these perfumes and lotions and he was coming up, he walked up to us and he had walked to a mall and he got all these samples and he was putting this stuff on his wrist and going, oh, here, you know, smell this. And, I'm looking at Randy, I'm like, what's this guy, you know? And, and then he, he quickly left. And that was it. That was my only interaction with him there. Uh, since then, I uh, didn't see him during all the mental health things because during that period of time, Kevin and I were still arch enemies and I was plotting on sneaking a bow and arrow into a concert and assassinating Kevin on stage. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it was just a fantasy. I just it was just a fantasy. It's all a bow and arrow. And, and but I read the book so, to find out more about the incident. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I still had a lot of hatred for Kevin, so I, I didn't pay too much attention to that. But it was shortly thereafter that, that we were actually able to finally meet up and make up and mend our fences. And um, 
you know, and, and that's something that I'm really glad that happened too. That's another one of my most precious moments ever. But uh, whenever they would play in Las Vegas, I would always go to the show. And sometimes they had Rudy. Most often they had somebody else. They had uh, mm -hmm. Kenny Hillary, who was a super, super sweetheart of a guy. Um, <clears throat> and they had Chuck. Most of the time it was Chuck, yep. who was also a great guy. And um, so I never really got to talk to Rudy. And I, I've, I had no interaction with him online whatsoever. I think we were probably Facebook friends or, you know, at the very least that. And, um, you know, it, we didn't say, hey, how you doing or anything like that. We never ever had an online conversation in, you know, writing or otherwise. So when it came time to do this, this show that I did on New Year's, um, I did have a chance to sit down with Rudy in the dressing room because we had about 45 minutes before we, you know, they went on. So I was hanging out back there and, and him and I just sat there and I said, I said to him, I said, you know, I said, because of our history, I said, this is, this is a talk that's needed to happen for a very, very long time. And he readily agreed and said, I'm glad we're finally having it. And, and we had a great conversation. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I could tell how much he loved Randy and, you know, in some ways, even Kevin, even though they had a little bit of a history, but, um, you know, everything he said was just so great. And we shared a bunch of stories and it was wonderful to finally be able to talk to him because I really actually did want to talk to the guy yeah. just because of where he had been and what our common shared things were. Strange and enough, so, Kelly, you were, if you look at you and Rudy, you're basically both bassists, both one of Randy's best friends, but at different times. Both had a hatred for Kevin at one point in your life and both reconciled with Kevin afterwards. I think Rudy reconciled with him, right? You see, that's the similarities I'm talking about. <laughs> so, you know, and we talked about all that stuff. Yes, we talked about Kevin. Yes, we talked about Frankie. We talked about Randy. You know, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, we talked about playing at the Starwood and, you know, and he told me stories about when he was with Randy and Ozzy and, and, and it was all just, just, just wonderful to be able to finally hear those, those words from him. It was a very, very relaxing conversation. It wasn't a stressful thing at all um, because I was thinking, you know, geez, you know, before the show, the night of the show, I'm like, God, I, you know, I did do a sound check the night before and he was, he was very cordial and very friendly and we chatted nicely together. And, and that was that. And I uh, didn't have a big long conversation until the next night, the night of the show. And that's when we did talk a long time. And again, it, I'm just really glad that you know that's cool i think it's a very good story it's amazing yeah it, it, i'm trying to remember did rudy say i think rudy had no hard feelings with kevin later on it was all good i, I don't remember i guess rudy doesn't want to hate anybody he no he doesn't he's a very nice person he's a very kind soul yeah I, I will only hate one person in this entire world and i won't mention his name okay well we know it's a him but he's kind of in the book <laughs> <laughs> another cliffhanger right another cliffhanger i think that's pretty much it i mean uh did you want to talk about the book that you're going to be releasing oh yeah yeah i do have a book coming out uh i think this is going to be uh shocking controversial i'll probably get in a lot of trouble people are going to think i'm insane um but uh, i'm 
you know, I'm kind of confident that people will see through that once they read the story. But I spent 20 years as a photographer. I primarily did uh, nudes and uh, for escort services, for brothels, um, and just girls who wanted to be naked. And, and that was pretty much what I did. I started out doing models and it morphed into this whole mood thing to where I became known for it. And I had a pretty good studio that could handle it. And, um, and plus I got all of Nevada. I mean, I'd go to Death Valley and stuff with these girls and um, find some just insanely great places to take pictures. And I had, I had a, a set of beautiful, beautiful models that were fantastic. And eventually I got into the art end of it and approached, uh, you know, nude art. Because I, you know, I knew there was a lot of books like that out there. I read some of them, I studied them. And I said, well, you know, maybe someday I'll do one, who knows? And well, someday came and I did do one. So while the picture does have 256 naked pictures in it, um, it's got a, a very good story. It's basically the story of a guy who starts a business from out of thin air and turns it into this big thing to where, you know, um, I had a pretty good life. You know, I was making good money. I was around beautiful women all the time, taking their clothes off. You know, <laughs> it might sound shamanistic a little bit to women. I don't know. It's art. I mean, it's art, it right? It's art. Women. But these days, how can you tell, you know? And when that's, when's that going to be released? Uh, it's finished. It's done. I'm just waiting on the graphics person right now. Uh, she is 95% done. And then from there, it's just an upload um, to the uh, site that's going to be, or the, the company that's going to be uh, printing this book. Mm -hmm. And then however long that takes. I have a website that, that should be up any time now i've given all the stuff to the web guy and after i get done with you i'm going to be sending him an email and saying you know when's my website going to be done and okay. it was pretty simple but it's got a lot of sample pictures oh. um, from the book so you can see what you're getting into if you do buy it okay. yeah, it's just, just so, uh, and some guy doesn't buy, oh, it's Kelly Garney's new book. Must be a bunch of stories about Randy Rhodes in here. No, 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 no. no. That, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the bait, right? <laughs> Different subjects all together, you know. But um, I love being a photographer, and I thought I would do it forever. And, and, and the book tells a story of how one day it just wasn't possible to do it anymore. Hey, do you ever, um, on another note, did you ever, do you, do you still speak to Drew Forsythe? Uh, I never talked to him. Okay. <laughs> um, and if you said, um, what kind of terms are you on with Drew? Um, the only answer I would have is no terms. Okay. The only things I've heard out of him, and he stays, you know, very low key in this whole Randy thing. He, he doesn't comment about much. Um, he does, he seems to me, without talking to him, but he seems like he really doesn't want any part of it because he's got his own thing going on, you know, whatever it is, real estate or something. You know, he doesn't need all this quiet riot stuff. And he, and he absolutely hated Kevin and in the end, and um, which is a great story in my book. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the first book, not the naked chick book, the first book. Well, okay. Um, all right, all right, all right. But yeah. With the he, incident. With the incident. I, I think uh, Drew perhaps surpassed uh, my hatred of Kevin in terms of its intensity because him and, him and Kevin had a beautiful blowout that I wish I could have seen. But um, I, yeah, I would say I'm not on any terms with him. The only things I've heard out of him was he did give a review of my first book, and he said it was a great work of fiction. 
Oh, is that on the back cover or something? Or is it, oh, okay. no, no, he just he posted it online. So okay, all right. And so that so yeah, hey, thanks, buddy. <laughs> um, but maybe I didn't paint him in the best the best of lights because in the band, you know, I mean, I didn't like Kevin, and Drew was tolerable and just tolerable. You know, but of course I loved Randy and, and that, that was my feelings in the band. But uh, aside from that, there was a documentary that was that was done. And Drew was uh, interviewed for that, the, doc, the failed documentary as it's famously known. And Drew was... Um, so wait a second. So let's, let's clear this up. So Ron Sobel released the Randy Rhodes Quiet Riot, Riot Years, that documentary. I liked it. I thought it was very good. I thought it was slow. I think it was very good. I, I don't know what the if, if that's one the one you're referring to. No. You're referring to the new one. No, this this not the new one. That oh, just you're referring out. to the original now, one. Now, actually, the new one that just came out that you can get on Amazon Prime and all that. Uh, that's actually Ronnie Soul stuff. He sold his. He licensed. You know, he licensed uh, his his stuff. Yeah. Guys, you know rehashed it and, and did their thing with it. But I just want to plug Ron. Ron did a great job on his original Randy Rhodes documentary. I really enjoyed that. I can't remember if you were on it. Were you on it? On um, what? It? Um, if I am, probably. Well, pro there's a lot of pictures. In the yes, movie. yes, yes. Yeah. But I, I know Ron, and Ron's a, it's a good guy, and he made a great documentary. And, and this new one that came out was rehash of a lot of this stuff that people have already seen and it did it was a 50 50 some people loved it the ones who didn't see the original documentary and 50 percent i haven't seen it i can't comment all i'm just saying is what the reaction I, was. I thought it was okay and you know my my general feelings on anything that has to do with randy is that anything randy is a good thing whatever it is you know um, it keeps his name alive. It keeps it keeps the legacy alive, and that's where I'm at. And it also makes the fans happy. I'm on the fan side, number one. Yeah, well, I'm not on anybody's side except the fan side, and the fans are the ones who want this stuff. So let's give it to them, and that's what I've always said. Um, <clears throat> there was yet another documentary as detailed in my book. <clears throat> In which perhaps my this is the Hollywood documentary, we'll call it the Hollywood documentary. A Hollywood documentary, yes. And perhaps my most hated person on planet Earth is involved in that whole thing. Well, from from what I see online and from the people that I've spoken to about this documentary, and I guess I've never seen the documentary. I don't know what happened and I'm not going to comment on either side. It's just everything went wrong. Uh, and uh, it, it was completed, but it was never released and it will stay that way. So that's yeah. my understanding. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's never coming out. There was already a lawsuit over the whole thing and everything. Yeah. And this resulted in, in a book uh, that's highly collectible now. Oh my God. I uh, was online yesterday and I saw this book. It's a, a, a big book, thick, great pictures. Um, you know, it's a beautiful book. It was beautifully done, very well done. Um, but uh, I saw it online last night for 800 and something dollars. Because they're out of print. Wow. Yeah, so it's a big time collector's item. Um, but you know, when it comes to things like that, like all these documentaries, like the new one that comes out or came out and, and books like that and stuff, you know, I, I always say to people, well, if you want to know how legit this whole thing is, look at who's not in it, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. I mean, if, if I, I agree with it 100%, you know, um, again, I'm not going to comment on it because I don't know all the details. All I know is that it's it's a shame that 
everyone can't come together in some sort of way where everyone's happy and they can release the greatest Randy Rhodes film ever made, like a biop, biopic, something like that. I would love to see something like that. Well, you know, who wouldn't? And, um, you know, I would even settle for something like they did with Motley Crue with exactly. the, the Dirt. Yeah. You know, just something like that, yeah. you know. But Kelly, your story and Randy's story, it's yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, you know, and, and on to, you know, they'd have to, you know, like they've just done with the, the that show, The Pistols, that's on. Yes, uh, yes. I believe you know, it's not the Sex Pistols, but it's a lot like them, you know, and all, all the graphics and everything makes you think, oh, say it's a Sex Pistols thing, you know, but it's really not. It's just about a bunch of guys doing exactly what the Sex Pistols did. And and I've, I've been finding it very entertaining. I also found one that looks like it's it's like a, a court. Did you rock. see Pistol? Did you see the, the, the miniseries Pistol? I'm, I'm watching it now. It's incredible. Yeah. It's really oh, yeah. good. It's incredible. It, it, spot on to, to the tone of the way Johnny Rotten speaks. Yeah. And believe it or not, uh, I'm a big punk rock fan. Me too. In yeah. fact, if I were to form another band, it would be a punk rock band. Punk, punk rock is where the energy of rock and roll comes from or metal. That's exactly right. Right. But there is talk of me playing again. And, and when I said, if I were to ever form another band, I'd form a punk rock band. It's not because I want to form a band. I, I really don't want to be in a band. I really like doing my art and, um, and I like writing, but I, I, I can't see any more books coming out of me. Um, there might be one, we'll see. But- um, Who would play you in a biopic of, uh, if we'll call it uh, the Randy Rhodes biopic? Well, Who would play well, you? Who would you want to play you? Johnny Depp? Young Johnny Depp. <laughs> that made your wife laugh, didn't it? I got a list, man. Okay, young Brad Pitt. That's actually my number one. Or uh, young... Um, who's that other guy I was just thinking of? Well, not George Clooney. I don't think he... <laughs> but no... You know, even if somebody did something like that, at least told the story because the whole thing's an interesting story. It is. It, it would have to be a mini series, though. It couldn't be done on one one you know sorry one two hour flick. It'd have to be like the pistol, like the movie. Yeah. The pistol, yeah. But you know, the interesting thing about Randy's story, and I suppose it, it makes it also my story and and some other people's. But the thing is. You know, it was already an interesting story up until when he passed away. That's right. And it's, it's done nothing but get more interesting. And with all the things that have happened. And so I think I think that helps keep his legacy alive because one thing Randy Rose isn't is boring. That's then, right. now, or tomorrow. Yeah, that's a great way. That's a great way to end it. And I think, you know what? We said we will end it when the time is right to end it. Do you think it's time to end it? It is, yes. <laughs> all right, so everybody, I'm going to show this again, all right? This is Quiet Riot 2. This is the album Quiet Riot 2. And you should definitely, oh, sorry, this is Quiet Riot 1. This is Quiet Riot 2. Phenomenal sound, beautiful packaging, no remorse records, do an incredible I job. It. I was like blown away. Yeah, and then we have Quiet Right One. Let me just show it again. I kept in this it package was, because I've just so did not... there one poster there now. There's a poster in here too, right? Yeah, there is. See, but I kept it sealed because I just I could, it would break my heart to open it up. Okay, well, I don't blame you. Hey, I don't blame you. I, you know, I've been waiting since I was a kid have these albums like legit you know i didn't want to get the bootleg you know so and here it is no remorse records does an incredible job let me show their logo again this is a bag now we can go grocery shopping <coughs> right there it is no remorse records great incredible job um i know it's not sanctioned by all the parties but i think 
it does justice to the legacy of the band. And here's Kelly oh. Gurney's book. I absolutely believe it does justice too. Look at this. Look, look at how many pages there are here. Look at this. And the incident, one last time, why Kelly Garney got thrown out of Quiet Riot <laughs> is all there. And and I believe, do I see why it could be? I think it's in the picture. No, it's not. But well, that could have been that night, that night when it happened right there. It could have been. It's, it kind of looked like that's the night it happened. I, I broke new ground in the Mayhem department. Kelly, it's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure with you, Jimmy. Thank you for everything. Bye-bye.